Hello, everyone, and welcome to Historic Richmond Town Talks, a living history museum meetup with Old Beth Page Village Restoration and our very own Historic Richmond Town. I'd just like to thank everyone for tuning in today. I'm personally in a, a history buff heaven right now because I have two great people to talk to today. So we're going to dive right in to what we're uh, going to be talking about. So really, this, this whole talk is really going to focus around living history and what that means when it comes to presenting historical facts to a public. So today's conversation brings together two living history museums across New York State, Old Bethpage Village Restoration on Long Island and Historic Richmond Town on Staten Island. These two institutions were created in the 20th century by historians, preservationists, and organizations of dedicated citizens concerned about preserving structures and landscapes that were rapidly disappearing in the midst of urban expansion and development of the last century. Our first guest, who I'm very excited to introduce, is Timothy Van Wickler, who is the museum manager of Old Beth Page Village Restoration, a 19th century living history museum on Long Island in Old Beth Page. Starting in 2004, Tim started out as, a, as an historic interpreter and a tradesman demonstrating broom making. In 2011, he became the manager and has put his efforts towards building OBVR into be a marquee of historic events, trade demonstrations, and interactive graphs for all to enjoy and participate in. Hey, Timothy, with us? Hey, Dom, yeah, I'm here. Excited to be here with you guys and, uh, and uh, with everybody else that's in attendance, and uh, this will be great. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks for having the village. Awesome. All right, now our other speaker today is none other than the infamous Luke Boyd, who is the Director of Education and Public Programs here at Historic Richmond Town, a living history museum village operated by the Staten Island Historical Society. Previously, Luke has worked as a frontline interpreter at Minuteman National Historical Park, which I'm very jealous of, the Mark Twain House and Museum, and the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. So hey, Luke, how's it going? Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is a really exciting opportunity. Dom, thanks for moderating today's conversation. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I just realized that my shirt is the same color of the wall in my office. Uh, very fortuitous. <laughs> so hope you can still see me with the green screen. Like a, it's like a camouflage. I like it. You got to be sure to be extra emotive to get over the uh, chameleon aspect. Okay, so I just want everyone listening in the chat uh, to know that you can post questions in the chat and I'll try to shout them out as uh, these two speakers are talking or when we get towards the end of their, of their presentations. But also there's a poll that everyone can go and fill out right now and we're going to come around back to that at the end. So if you go to the bottom of the screen, if you're on a laptop, you should be have a, have a toolbar there and poll should be one of them. So, Please fill that out because we really we want this to be as interactive as possible and we're super excited that all of you are here to, to listen today. So without any further ado, um, I would like to uh, pass it off to Tim and so we can begin this presentation. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Dom. And uh, again, Luke, thanks for, uh, for setting this up first and foremost. Um, you know, thinking of the village and, and getting both of these living history museums together is Absolutely incredible. Um, so super happy that we can be a part of it. We're looking forward to working together in the future and with other museums too. Um, it's great that everybody can uh, sort of get that, uh, all the different perspectives because we do so many things so similarly, but also so differently at the same time. Um, so what I'm gonna do here guys, just bear with me for a second. We're going to share the screen. Um, actually, uh, Luke, if you could, just need to enable screen sharing real quick. We work in the 19th century, folks, so this is, this is what happens sometimes. Um, that's okay. No worries. Um, but yeah, so while we're getting that loaded... Um, You're good to go. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So Old Bethpage Village Restoration is a generally 19th century living history museum on Long Island. Um, we're going to get started here by just looking through a few slides. First and foremost, I thought uh, before we get 
really, really into each of our places. I just wanted to briefly show uh, how Luke and I met. Um, interestingly, we did not meet in the 19th century. We didn't meet in the 21st century. We met in 1943. Uh, there's me looking a little, a little, uh, a little weirded out in the uh, in the in the uh, British armored vehicle, and there's Luke as Winston Churchill, which uh, later maybe maybe Luke will give us some some of his Churchill impression. Uh, obviously, they're there with. Uh, with News 12 and with, uh, with a museum that we both have ties to, um, the Museum of American Armor, who operates here on our property, but I'll be talking about them in a little bit more. Um, and uh, yeah, special thanks to Gary Louie too, who, who linked the two of us up uh, professionally, which is awesome. So that way we could have things like this for now and into the future. And just get rid of this here. Okay. So in 1962, um, there had already been rumblings of the idea of opening up a living history museum on Long Island. And by 1962, this is actually a copy that uh, was just brought to my attention recently of the original resolution basically talking about purchasing the property for Nassau County. Um, Old Bethpage Village is owned and operated by Nassau County. Um, we're part of their Parks, Recreation, and Museums Department, uh, which is great because our funding pretty much stays consistent, which is amazing. Um, and we have lots of great people working here and behind the scenes that, that nobody ever gets to see. But uh, 1962. In 1963, uh, all the finalizations happen where we are finally able to have the property available and we can finally start moving buildings here. Um, I actually recently found uh, by way of Gary Hammond, who was a longtime employee here uh, and one of the managers as well. I found a, a record of the uh, Nassau County Historical Society Journal from 1989 and it was doing a, a piece on the 20th anniversary of Old Bethpage Village Restoration um, written by Ed Smith, who was one of the founders here. So I just wanted to read a couple, because uh, a couple excerpts of that, because that actually goes into sort of more about how uh, the village came to be. Um, so these are in, in uh, Mr. Smith's words. It says, in 1970, the Long Island Daily Press editorial on July 2nd acclaimed Old Bethpage Village Restoration and its future role in Long Island as one of the nation's most outstanding living examples of honest folklore. No tourist trap with suspect credentials this, it is authentic. So the idea was pretty much to bring these buildings here and set up to be one third the scale of a real 19th century village on Long Island. So we have approximately 209 acres here. So we have a lot of property. We have, uh, now we have about 18 or 19 homes, over 50 historic structures here. And then we do have a few reproduction structures on the property too, mostly sheds and things like that. Um, but the, the idea behind bringing them here was that uh, in the 1950s and the early 1960s, the population size on Long Island was increasing like crazy. And I'm sure, and I'm sure Staten Island has a similar story. Obviously, uh, Richmond Town has its, has its start a little bit earlier than us, which Luke will get into, um, but it's pretty cool. So the population was increasing, therefore the roads needed to increase in size and they needed more space available. Unfortunately, a lot of these older buildings uh, were becoming more dilapidated and they were being leased out by the towns for the most part. So simply put, it became tear them down or move them. And luckily there were people in Nassau County at the time that were so very interested in moving them that we were finally able to bring them here. Uh, they started moving buildings here, I believe in 64 or 65. And then we finally opened in June of 1970, which is where that last excerpt came from. Um, what's kind of interesting is I read this from, from Ed Smith's too, which I, I don't know, I just thought it was kind of uh, interesting of how they found this place. I, and again, I never knew this in the past couple of weeks doing more research in the, in, on the property here. Um, so in his words, I pulled off the road down a dirt path leading to a group of dilapidated buildings, including a large 1920s potato storage shed Although completely ramshackle, the area included an early 1800s Long Island farmhouse and carriage shed. Research indicated this was the homestead of the Powell family, original settlers of Long Island. A hidden valley of old farm fields covered with waste high by woodland on all sides lay northward from the farm buildings, which is where the village is now. We didn't have to look to acquire a historic farmstead. The county was soon to own one. So, seemingly from sheer happenstance they wound up purchasing the property and then finding these things kind of destroyed in the woods um, and then building them back up to restore restore them um, and that's what we're going to take a look at next year again this one's from 1965 this is a brochure 
uh, for showing what was soon to be. And, and at that time, they were actually shooting for a 1968 opening. So the village was actually, uh, by the time that it opened, it was actually two years behind schedule. Um, but that gave time for the, uh, for the curatorial staff and for the interpreters to be able to have more of an ability to hone their skills, get everything as accurate as possible for the time, um, and try to make the experience as good as possible. Uh, Luke, Dom and I were talking um, a few weeks ago, and one of the things that I said to them was, uh, one time I was, I'm a, I'm a big, if anybody's ever met me, I am a big uh, Disney parks guy, uh, especially with the history of it, which is, which is really cool to me. But um, one of the things that I was watching for it uh, was one of the Imagineers, uh, Tony Baxter, and he was saying that Disneyland is more local, the one in California, is more local. It's quaint and charming. Disney World in Florida is more spectacular, all right? There's a lot more to it. You're getting tourists from all over the country, all over the world. Um, and that's kind of how we were sort of relating um, uh, historic Richmond Town and Old Bethpage Village restoration to, say, Colonial Williamsburg, which I think in the United States, Colonial Williamsburg is probably the pinnacle of living history sites, especially on the East Coast. Um, and so ours are much more local. We have wonderful things to offer, might not be as grand of a scale as Colonial Williamsburg has, but still things that we have that are really, really great. And we still, both places, get, get people from all over the world as well. So next what we have are how some of the buildings were moved here. Um, up in the top left corner, that's actually the Cooper House. And that's, that's kind of um, the one person who uh, has a home here that is a claim to fame. Peter Cooper was a known philanthropist at the time. He actually ran for election in the 1870s, um, but he obviously didn't win. Otherwise, most people would have heard of Peter Cooper. Um, he's actually responsible for a lot of uh, inventions from that time period and a lot of things that we still have or were built off of um, for things today. Um, namely, he invented the first steam train in the United States. Uh, he founded Cooper Union in Manhattan, which was a free education. So a really, really cool gentleman. Um, and when he was running for president, uh, the thing that was kind of interesting with him is political cartoons aren't much different today than they were at the time. Uh, they're trying to slander the other guy. And the only thing that the cartoonist had against Peter Cooper was that he was an old man at that point. So he's always depicted with a very long beard and very hunched over, and there's not much else to it. Um, that's just that's just it. Otherwise, he was pretty well liked. Uh, if anybody, especially the, the people watching from, um, from the Staten Island, New York City area, if you guys have ever been to McSorley's, that's right by Cooper Union. Uh, McSorley's is one of the oldest breweries in the country. Um, and Peter Cooper actually used to go there uh, all the time. He had his own stool, and the stool is actually still up behind the bar. It has a few things on top of it, but if you ask any of the employees there, they, they can tell you about it. Um, all right, that's a rant. If you guys know me, I rant on random facts a lot. Um, so there we go, there's one. Uh, bottom left corner down here, that's actually a concept drawing of what the village was possibly going to look like. Again, this is from the mid-1960s, so just when they start moving some of the buildings there, Pretty much on that drawing from what we have today for our, for our general layout, the only buildings that are in basically the same spot are the church up at the top uh, and the Powell Farmhouse is that big building to the right. Um, everything else is sort of in the middle um, and that's not really how it wound up. Like you can see the blacksmith shop there, there's the, another general store, the Noon Inn, which is our tavern that we have here. Um, so everything got manipulated. When you're trying to, to build anything, you need to uh, you know, try to figure out what works best. And, you know, they wound up putting things here. When they opened, they actually had a, like a trades row where there was broom making in one building, then blacksmith, then the hat shop, then there was weaving, there were a whole bunch of things and they wanted to make a row of it. However, to the best of my understanding, historically, blacksmith shops actually belong on the outside of town because back then they did realize that, hey, this smoke is not actually that great to breathe in, so maybe it shouldn't be here. But it was put there for the purposes of, of demonstrating to, to our visitors. You could see some of the buildings um, over on the right-hand side during the restoration process. That's the Noon Inn up on the top right um, and the Benjamin House on the bottom right. What's kind of cool, if anybody is, uh, I know I, we probably have a lot of museum people in here, but if anybody's kind of a, a novice into it, um, if you're ever looking to figure out a date on a building, look at the transportation around it. So up on the top right, you can see that late 60s, early 70s vehicle, and that's when that picture was taken from. This is the layout of the village now. We have some aerial views. 
Um, the one on the bottom right is actually from a, from a postcard, I think from 83, 1983. Um, the other one on the left is from the, uh, from the 1970s. So if you've ever been to our village, there are actually some buildings missing in that because they weren't brought here just yet. Uh, notably, the fairgrounds building. Uh, every year we hold a big Long Island fair in the fairgrounds building, um, which is a reproduction uh, of a building that existed in the 1870s in Mineola. We hold weddings and things like that in there now. Okay, so over time, we've held a ton of different events here and had lots of different things that you would consider to be um, historical attractions, all right? Uh, so in the center, those are photos from our candlelight evenings more recently. Um, really, really nice time of year. We have lots of uh, great entertainment. Almost every building's lit up by candlelight. Um, it's really, really nice. Uh, on the top right, I just wanted to throw this in, a uh, shameless pig plug. So basically we just got some, uh, we just got some new piglets. So we actually are doing a naming contest, but um, we'll talk more about that later. But, uh, but yeah, there's our two piglets, who baby animals. Um, and then the two other photos, the older photos, the one on the top left is something that we definitely can't do anymore um, for liability purposes, I'm sure, but they actually used to grease the flagpole as well as grease the, the pigs that we had here. And they would put employees in there and, well, let's talk about the, the flagpole. They would put the employees up there and whoever reached the top would collect the money, which was $10 or something like that. But it's the 1970s. It's not now where $10 is like, I don't know if it's worth it for 10 bucks. But, you know, back then it went a little bit further. Um, and then over on the right, where you see the lady shooting, uh, this actually, before it was purchased by the county, this property was actually a shooting range. Um, and so some of that carried over where they actually, she's not firing a blank rifle. That is a, that is a loaded gun. Um, they actually used to do actual target practice here uh, as part of it. Uh, they would demonstrate the um, Hempstead Light Guard, which was, a, which was a light militia unit during the 1840s. So really, really just an, a very interesting, uh, just a very interesting time um, when they did lots of different things. Some of the things we can't do anymore, uh, some of the things we carried on, and then we're also always adding new things to it, which is great. Uh, basically, we wanted to show typical examples of life on Long Island at the time. And so by doing things like that, which would happen during festivals or by doing candlelight evenings, not to say they all did a giant event like that, but this is what it would look like in the wintertime uh, at night. So this, talking about the uh, Museum of American Armor, um, over the past few years, we've been sort of expanding uh, how we do things. And on our property, um, down at the mouth of the driveway is the Museum of American Armor, uh, which is a wonderful museum that has tons of pieces. For the most part, they are World War II vehicles, um, but they do have things going up through the Vietnam era, uh, as well as some slightly older than World War II as well. And we work with them on a lot of different programming. They do their armor experience experiences, uh, which is basically where visitors can, can hop on a ride um, and they get to be in the, uh, in the moment. So we have, we have GI reenactors uh, and German reenactors too, because you need to have an enemy. Um, so you have them together and uh, the people are on the vehicles. It's really, really great, really awesome. Um, I do it, actually that's me up in the top right. Um, another program that we do with them is a, is a high school program um, for middle school and high school kids where they go around from station to station and they get to learn different things. Um, I'm in the National Guard. I'm not a, a sergeant, um, but I get to pretend to be a drill sergeant. It's awesome. Um, you know, uh, high school kids, yelling at high school kids, that's great. Um, by the way, that's a joke. Um, all right, <laughs> so moving on from that, uh, what we're gonna do is take a look at some of the trades um, like Dom said in the beginning, we've been trying to bolster our trades here. Back in the 70s and the 80s, they had a lot. Then it sort of dwindled out in the 90s and the early 2000s, and, and we're trying to build it back up. Not all of our trades happen every single day, and I know Luke will talk more about trades in a little bit. Um, but some of the things that we have to offer uh, are things like natural dyeing. I'm going left to right um, from the top to the bottom. So we do natural dyeing uh, where basically you take natural resources um, and you're able to crush them up, mix them with liquid. And then you can dye like wool in there, um, which is super cool. Uh, if you guys have ever seen um, any movies or anything of British redcoats, right, during the Revolutionary War, and they're wearing that vibrant red color. Um, the red actually uh, at that time was coming from a uh, something called cochineal, 
And when the Europeans made their way to Central and South America, they found out that this cochineal uh, was for sale there. Then the indigenous peoples were selling it to them. And uh, it's great, they brought it home. Cochineal looks like a little ball. Um, it feels almost metal-like. Uh, and they put it in the ground and nothing happened. And did it again and nothing happened. And did it again and nothing happened. Turns out cochineal is actually a bug that walks around on prickly pear cactus. Um, and so you can't grow cochineal, you have to breed it. Um, uh, but it's so, uh, it has such high iron levels that when you crush up the dead, the dead bug, they actually turn this bright red color, which is so cool. Um, we also do uh, hearth cooking and baking, like we have on the top middle, broom making. Okay, broom making is one of those cool things that not too many places do, which is awesome. Um, a lot of times people will look at things like blacksmithing and say that's a dying trade. Broom making is already, it's already dead. Um, there's not many people, especially in the Northeast, that, that do it. So it's cool that we can offer here. Uh, hat finishing, again, blacksmithing, and then weaving on top of other fiber arts and, and things like leather tooling and basket weaving and things like that. We try to do as much as we can, as often as we can, because we want to show that to you. Um, show you things that you don't necessarily always think about or, uh, you know, nowadays we can just go buy a, buy a, buy a t-shirt, but back then you had to get the fabric, make the fabric, uh, dye it, you had to do everything to get that shirt for yourself or that dress for yourself. The thing that makes Old Bethpage, historic Richmond town, Old Sturbridge village, Colonial, the, well, the thing that makes them what they are and what makes them so special is the people that we have behind them. Um, so here I, I just threw in a whole collage of just a bunch of people um, that have been around you know, during the, the 50 years. We're actually celebrating 50 years this year in 2020. Um, so this is just some of the people uh, there have been countless countless amounts to get to the experiences here uh, which makes your visit so special um, you know you could come here five days a week and if there is someone in the general store they might not be in the general store the next day so you might not to say that they're going to change the story of anything but everybody highlights different things that interest them a lot um, and so that's what makes it unique and that's what makes your experience unique and that's what you want to get out of a place like this um, but what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to turn it back over to Luke and Dom. So I'm just going to hit stop share here and, uh, and, uh, we'll see what, uh, historic Richmond, what you got Richmond town. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim, for that. That was amazing. And, um, I'm super jealous and I want to go out there immediately now. Um, so I gotta, I, I just want to ask everyone can, uh, post questions in the chat if they want me to ask them to him, if you have anything that's uh, burning to ask Tim. But I would just love to know, um, you said that the houses were a collection from, um, a lot of them were brought from other places to where they are now. How far of a range are we talking when it comes to where a lot of these uh, colonial houses are from? Sure, yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Um, so even though we are owned by Nassau County, Nassau County did not actually exist until the late 1890s. Um, everything prior to that, there were, there were three counties geographically on Long Island. There was Suffolk, which is the same size as Suffolk today. Nassau, uh, I'm sorry, Suffolk, Queens, which was Queens and Nassau today. So it was, Queens was gigantic. Um, and Kings, which is Brooklyn. Um, and so we have buildings from as far west as College Point, Queens. Uh, and we have buildings mostly in Nassau County. And then we have stuff all the way as far east as Manorville on Long Island, which is on the North Fork. I believe it's at 67 or 68 on the Long Island Expressway. We're at exit uh, 48. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, where the expressway starts is much farther west than, than where we are now. So we, we like to, we have a good span of the buildings, which is, which is great to bring those different areas. That's awesome. And okay, I just, this might be a more personal question because I love World War II so much, but um, how do you guys balance the, because you have uh, the American Armory Museum so close to you guys and you do a lot of connective stuff together and I think that's amazing, but how do you balance that sort of break when you have a uh, organization dedicated to representing things centuries after uh, where most of the stuff from old Beth Pages? Sure, yeah, another good question, Dom. So um, basically, 
like I said, our, our median age here in the village is about 1835 to 45. Um, we do events that are Revolutionary War and we do events that are World War II. So obviously both of those are out of our time bubble. Um, for some of them, we do actually uh, incorporate like, uh, especially with the Revolutionary War stuff or if we ever do any Spanish American or anything like that, we incorporate it. The armor experiences, um, when the Armor Museum runs them on their own, they come here early in the morning and they actually use this as a as like a French village in the 1940s because it does kind of look like a country village at the time. Um, and then when they do their larger events with lots of vehicles going back and forth, um, when we have the encampments and things like that, they use the uh, one of the fields where we almost operate it like a time bubble. Um, but it, it's it's great to work with those guys um, on all ends of the spectrum, the living historians, the reenactors, um, everybody from all over that, that comes here. And I'm sure it's the same way for you guys, because um, I know you guys have a lot of, of that as well. Uh, it's, it's just incredible. And to be able to work with everybody for the same common goal of basically um, edutainment, to bring up another Disney term. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's how to entertain people and educate them at the same time in a way that's easy to understand. And just a sidebar, I, I don't think that I said this, if anyone's not 100% sure, and this will go the same way with, with when Luke's talking too, um, interpreter, okay? A lot of times people think if we say interpreter, they think that we're translating Spanish to English or French to English or something like that. An interpreter is a way of making history understandable to a modern audience. So when you're in a museum, if you hear interpreter, generally speaking, they're talking about living history. Awesome. We, got, we also have a question from the chat, uh, which is, at a time when classroom learning has become problematic, can living history destinations become even more relevant? Uh, that is a knocked it out of the park. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so yes. Um, so I'm sorry, wait, can you repeat the question? Make sure that I'm answering it right. <laughs> um, so at a, at a time when classroom learning has become problematic, and this is something that the three of us were talking about just a few days ago. Um, right, right, right. At a time when classroom learning has become problematic, can living history destinations become even more relevant? Yeah, so, you know, with the uncertainty of um, schools returning um, or if there's going to be any field trips or anything like that, uh, it, there's definitely an ability to come out to living history sites with your family uh, or to check out what the offerings are on the social media or on their websites, um, what sort of program is going on, because basically living history sites are your textbook. Just you opened it up and you jumped inside. Um, so it makes it pretty cool that you are surrounded entirely by history. You can bring that to life uh, and you can, depending on which ones you go to, uh, and, and I think Luke will mention this too about third person versus first person, but um, we, uh, since we're third person, some places that you first person, you are, you are part of the history, you are part of the story. Um, so it's really, really cool. I think it's it's living history museums are some of my favorite and even traditional museums um, are starting to incorporate uh, living historians into it to, to make it more relatable to people. I think that's a great point, Tim. And uh, I think what this pandemic has done, it's forced living history museums to step into the 21st century with regards to how we deliver programming because, or we're accustomed to being the place, the destination. You come to us, you see the incredible structures we have, the costumes, the interpreters, the tradespeople. Um, but now that mode of communication is cut off, so to speak. So a lot of living history museums are thinking of ways of doing virtual offerings, virtual field trips. And on the one hand, it's not as authentic as the sensory experience of living history, which is so often uh, about sights and smells and things you can experience. And if you're through a screen, you don't have that experience. But on the other hand, you can collapse a, a system or a process or a trade. For example, it might take three hours to bake a cake. If you like film something or make it virtual, you can make that much shorter and package it for a field trip. So you can actually do other activities and demonstrations that maybe you other wouldn't, wouldn't be able, otherwise be able to do because of logistical constraints. Um, and I think, you know, as we go forward into the new school year, it'll be very interesting to see how schools come to us and what they're looking for. 
um, I think they'll be searching for the authentic. And if we can meet them there, then we can continue to engage the students that we have for decades and maybe reach some, some populations that we otherwise wouldn't because of distance as well. You know, Beth Page and, and, and um, old, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, Richmond Town are about 50 miles apart. Uh, but they're sort of like in their own, you know, there's like, it, that may as well be a hundred miles because it's just, it's very sort of hyper local sort of audiences that we attract. Um, even though we're in the five boroughs of New York, I, I would say the students we get from the Bronx, very, very few, you know. So if we can reach kids that we otherwise couldn't, that would be a great thing. So it'll be interesting to look at the future. Dom, are you ready for my, my slides? I'm ready to go. Yeah, I was about to say, what an eloquent preamble to, all right, so anyway, now we're going to head on into Luke's presentation, and uh, if you can share his screen, okay, awesome, here we go. Okay, I am in, thank you so much. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us at home, thank you for registering for this program, thank you for supporting Historic Richmond Town and Old Beth Page Restoration. Uh, we are committed to providing opportunities for learning throughout this pandemic, uh, and I'm so happy that we're able to reach you today. We are broadcasting live. Dom and I are socially distanced across this building in historic Richmond Town. This is the Stevens Prior House, which is an original structure to historic Richmond Town, to the site. Uh, it's a great structure that combines Greek revival and Italianate uh, architecture. Um, historic Richmond Town is a beautiful uh, outdoor museum that contains over 40 structures and it's set upon 100 acres of New York City parkland. It has the distinction of being the most complete living history village in the five boroughs of New York City. But when you think about it, as far as the five boroughs are concerned, Staten Island is probably the only borough in which a site like this could be created. A site that is, was traditionally very agrarian, very rural, and was really only developed in the 20th century. You know, this Verrazano Bridge was the main connector to Staten Island in the 1960s. Um, so historic Richmond Town is a product of the 20th century, but Richmond Town is a real place. It's a real neighborhood, people live in it today, and it was the center of, uh, of life, arguably, in this region going back to the 1600s, 1700s. So this is an aerial view in our collection and it shows us Richmond Town uh, a few decades ago. There are some buildings that are gone. There are some buildings that are, were brought to the site after this photograph was taken. But basically, Richmond Town is nestled at the intersection of two ancient roads on Staten Island, Richmond Road and Arthur Kill Road. Now, we talk about American life at Richmond Town, but in reality, these roads, like Broadway and Manhattan, were essentially based on Native American hunting trails and paths that would have traversed uh, this landscape. So although we're in the 21st century, the, uh, the indigenous peoples in those stories are never too far away. And the further you look at a site like this, the more context you can discern. For those big fans of Richmond Town, you can see here with my mouse, there's the third county courthouse. I believe the building that we are in is right over here. And then I want you to pay attention to this little building right here. I'm going to analyze that building in just a few minutes. But you can see uh, Staten Island, extremely green. It is the borough of parks, but we're right next to the green belts, essentially. So there's a lot of natural life that comes through Richmond Town, but also a lot of 21st century life. Cars drive right through Richmond Town on Richmond Road. It's a main thoroughfare, um, but the Canadian geese of our property often bring traffic to a grinding halt. Uh, oh. So this is... <laughs> this is the stage in which um, we are set. Um, so Richmond Town as a place goes back to the 1600s. Uh, the first buildings were situated along Arthur Kill Road, so right along this thoroughfare. There were several buildings on this side of Arthur Kill Road. It was not always called Richmond. When the Dutch first landed here, it had several names. It, may have, it was uh, called Cockleshtown for some time, and that name was derived from the oysters that would be found in great abundance along Richmond Creek around the uh, Fresh Kill area. So there's great fresh waterways that are traversing towards Richmond Town. And so that of course would attract people to settle. Uh, it would adopt the name Richmond when after the British would settle uh, in Staten Island. And of course, after uh, American independence, it became known as Richmond Town, Richmond County after all. And our courthouse was the center of uh, judiciary life in Staten Island. Um, if you were. So historic Richmond Town today is not just 
the village. So we have four properties. Uh, the main property is Mid Island, where we are right now. Uh, as you see, this big red red dot right here denotes that. But we have several other properties as well that are all part of this one unit. Uh, the Decker Farm is situated here in New Springville. Near Dongan Hills and Toad Hill is the Perrine House, which dates to 1677, one of the oldest houses in New York State. And on the North Shore towards St. George is the Judge Jacob Tyson House. So we're spread across this island that is seven miles by 14 miles. Uh, and here are some photos from our four sites that all contribute to this place. Uh, some of these places are preserved but not available to the public every day, but we are working to make that, uh, make the case where we can have more programming there. Certainly young children recall uh, coming to Decker Farm every year for pumpkin picking, for farm demonstrations, and as we look towards the fall, we hope to revive those traditions um, through the, uh, the pandemic situation. So we talked about Cocklestown, but the organization that is historic Richmond Town goes back to 1856. In 1856, the Staten Island Historical Society was formed, and that is the governing body, so to speak, of our, our site to this day. Uh, in the 1930s, the Historical Society began to evolve. And you can see this is a, a, a grab from one of our Staten Island historians, a publication that's been published on and off uh, for decades, a, sort of an academic journal exploring local history on Staten Island. And you can see the date of this is January 1938. Um, and so this is really as historic Richmond Town as we know it today is beginning to grow and come into fruition. So by the 1930s, by the time of the Great Depression, many buildings in Staten Island were abandoned if property owners would leave or if uh, they were abandoned for various reasons. And so the courthouse, the, the building you saw on the last slide, was one of those buildings that was set aside by the government when they moved the courthouse to the North Shore of St. George. And that along with the surrogates court building became the first two structures really accessioned into the, into the collection, so to speak, of buildings in historic Richmond Town. You might see a name that appears at the top of this page, Loring McMillan. Um, he was one of the drivers of this place, uh, creating historic Richmond Town, preserving historic Richmond Town. And it's largely his vision that led to the village we have today. And so we find ourselves in 2020 confronting that vision and thinking, where are we going in the next five, 10, 15, 50 years? So it's interesting, these living history museums are born and then they remain usually in, in a similar fashion for a long time. And it takes a long time to update and to revive uh, traditions and interpretations um, of the site. So in the, from the 1850s to the 1930s, the Staten Island Historical Society was mainly interested in collecting objects, uh, lots of farm tools, lots of uh, materials from early American life. And as the buildings are being collected, now you have a collection of items, ar objects, artifacts, and you have a collection of buildings. And so those two things come together in education, in program, in this living history village. Uh, the history of historic Richmond Town is fascinating, and I appreciate you uh, uh, permitting me to, to go on about this. I find it fascinating, the group of people who created this place. So this uh, photograph is, this is an amazing photo. This is downtown Richmond Town, so to speak, right in front of the surrogates courthouse. This is an early tour of historic Richmond Town, and shout out to uh, Maxine Friedman and Sarah Clark from our curatorial division who were so helpful getting me these images. Um, the gentleman seen here with uh, the, the, the hat sort of bowing reflectively is Laurie McMillan. So he was uh, an engineer. Uh, I'm sorry, he worked with the phone companies in New York City and New York State. Uh, but he became very interested in this process. And he became the custodian of, of, the, of the buildings uh, in the 1930s. He's leading a tour uh, of some very sharply dressed people through the village. Um, and this is how it began, with volunteers giving their time uh, to examine a building, to knock on doors of older Staten Islanders and collect their old histories, to solicit collection items and objects. And slowly but surely, over the decades, the collection grows and the, uh, the nexus of Richmond Town continues to grow. So it was a sleepy little town in the 1930s. And uh, Loring McMillan was very animated about preserving it. And he had his sights on several buildings. Remember I said you to, I told you to look at that little building on the map on the corner? It's called the Vorlazers House. Loring McMillan was very interested in the Vorlazers House. Uh, it was believed 
that the Vorleser, who, which is Dutch for lay reader or teacher, was a sort of early clerical educational figure in the Dutch settlement of Staten Island. And it was believed that the building on the left, there's really two buildings here, this, the older, shorter building on the left, right here, if you draw a line right here, it was believed that this was the original Vorleser's house. And so research continues for a period of years. The bricks are stripped away, we're looking at the old wood, looking at the elements, and the modern Acorn Inn, with the Dutch master's cigars, very ironic, is lopped off the building. And the Vorleser restoration begins in earnest. So over the 1930s and 40s, the building is beginning to resemble its older self. And so historic Richmond Town, earlier known as Richmond Town Restoration, was a laboratory for restoration techniques. People would come here from all over the country to learn how to date and how to restore old structures. So not only is it informing the local population, it's informing a wider population as well. And this is the Vorlazer's house as it appears today. Um, interesting story about the Vorlazer's house. For many years, it was thought this building went back to the 1690s. However, a few years ago, there was a study done on the building, and it was determined that due to dendrochronology and other st scientific studies, that the building most likely dated from the 1760s. So the, it was the new Vorlazer's house as opposed to the original structure that was there. So as a site, Richmond Town had to confront uh, revising its understanding of a venerable old building that had been there for so long. Today, the Vorlazer's house is presented as a old uh, schoolhouse, one of the oldest schoolhouses in the country. Needless to say, the building has immense value and it is an incredible structure, but it is important to be flexible in uh, our understanding of the past and our understanding of these structures. So the reinterpretation is happening a lot, whether we acknowledge it or not, or plan it or not, it happens all the time. We're always revising the body of knowledge. Um, so in the 1940s and 50s, historic Richmond Town is beginning to take shape. This is an amazing photograph. Uh, of uh, a tour of Richmond Town a few decades later. The same gentleman we saw with the hat is now this, uh, this, this very well sharply dressed man here on the left, Loring McMillan, who is speaking to several officials, including Robert Moses, uh, one of the great sort of power brokers, as he is known, of New York City. Robert Moses uh, was called the patron saint of historic Richmond Town by Loring McMillan. Uh, these two men struck up an unlikely bond uh, Robert Moses, of course, was interested in creating highways and parkways as he was the commissioner of different park commissions and he held various titles, uh, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority and the like. And it's amazing that Robert Moses didn't want a highway to go right through Richmond Town, but aren't we glad that that is the case? Um, so Robert Moses called on, uh, on, on Warren McMillan and described Richmond Town as a professional museum run by amateurs, which so sort of goes to the point I said before about the volunteer spirit of historic Richmond Town. So Robert Moses would help get city and capital funding to match many of the grand projects of Richmond Town. So as they're restoring old buildings, they're also bringing in buildings to Richmond Town that were not original to the site, but were endangered. They were abandoned, they were going to be demolished, and Loring McMillan was very adroit at getting these buildings moved to historic Richmond Town. I want to focus one more moment on Loring McMillan's vision. Uh, in an interview he gave with WNYC in the 1960s, he waxes eloquently on the merits of Richmond Town. And he says, as opposed to Old Sturbridge Village, or as opposed to Williamsburg, this museum was not created by a Rockefeller. It was not created by a, a wealthy individual. It was created by everyday people who came together and donated their time. So it's a very democratic idea. And he also said the place was dedicated to understanding the lives of everyday Americans, of the common man, of not the great men of history, but of the lowly basket maker, of the tinsmith, the blacksmith, the everyday folk. Very similar, it rhymes very much with the idea of old Bethpage village restoration. And finally, Laurie McMillan was proud that one could take a bus all the way to Richmond Town. The bus line goes right through the museum site itself. So it had access. And this was also a great 
boon for Richmond town. And of course, with the Verrazano Bridge and modern transportation, it's very easy to get here, but uh, we often find that it's a well-kept secret. And uh, you're all helping contribute to uh, changing that in this webinar today. So I want to show you some photos of moving buildings across, across various areas. Uh, this is a, a cottage that would become known as the Basket Maker's House. This beautiful image is in its original location. Uh, this building was identified as one that could be saved, and it was lifted from its foundation, just like the pictures of Old Beth Page, and it was brought to Richmond Town settled on the banks of the Richmond Creek and became the basket maker's house. It's a beautiful building today, a beautiful example of restoration. Basket making may not have transpired in the walls of that house, but we know that basket making happened here in Cocklestown because baskets were a great vessel for collecting oysters. So what happens is buildings are brought to Richmond Town and they become staging areas for living history trades. Those trades may not have been practiced in those buildings, but they were practiced on this island. They were practiced in this country. So what has to happen is you have to have a little bit of flexibility when you're presenting these things, because I think people ask similar questions when they come to place like this. They ask, what's original? What's not? And you have to say, well, this place is original, but it was made to look like its original self when it was first built, because it didn't always look like this. The items are original to the time, but not to the building. You know, the, the practice that I'm doing is an original trade that we've practiced here. So, you know, that's the, the challenge of the interpreter to, you know, not let those asterisks be a detraction, but to be a source of engagement. I think people like the backstory of these places. Um, another example is the Tinsmith shop today was formerly the Cologne General Store. Uh, that was also lifted from its foundation, brought to Richmond Town right along Center Street, and now occupies a proud spot in the center of historic Richmond Town. And there is our very own Dom Hood uh, posing very decoratively outside the building. Um, so this is the, these are the common sites that we see in historic Richmond Town today uh, in these, uh, these various uh, trade, trade sites. So this is like 60s into the 70s, the bicentennial. The, one of the later moves was in 1987. The Crocherin House was moved to historic Richmond Town. And this, this photo is really telling. Again, Tim's hint about cars gives a lot of things away. So this is, this is 1980s. There's your uh, NYPD Bronco in the back. Uh, but you can also see in the background of this photo, you can see modern development. You, you know, Staten Island is exploding in population post Verrazano Bridge. And so the danger of these buildings being demolished or lost or repurposed is still there. And Historic Richmond Town is saying we are that home for these lost buildings, so to speak. The story goes that the Crocher and House uh, move was very dramatic and that uh, the building actually was given free parking tickets by the NYPD. Um, so a very interesting uh, little nugget of information uh, of the drama of moving these structures. So living history at Richmond Town goes back probably about 50 years as well, at least. Um, this photograph is from 1932. And we might think of this as a living history image. This almost looks like a Colonial Williamsburg pageant. This is at the Perrine House uh, on Richmond Road, the building from 1677. This is the bicentennial of George Washington's birthday. So it's a very elaborate scene of these ladies and these powdered wigs and these dresses. Um, this is not perhaps living history as we would think of it today, not the same kind of performance, more based in costume, in photographs, pageantry, we would have seen these all over the United States, um, you know, in parade floats, people dressed up like uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, people signing the Declaration of Independence. Apparently, one of the men in the photograph is supposed to be Paul Revere. So this is very much interested in, the, in commemorating the revolution. Um, I wonder if a similar scene will transpire in 2032. Our, uh, our attitudes have, have changed about, you know, what dates we commemorate and what sort of holidays we observe. So that's the earliest trace I could find of living history at historic Richmond Town, though I'm sure there are others. Um, but if you go to the bicentennial, 60s and around 1975, 1976, this is really when living history is one of the most popular historical pursuits in this country. And historic Richmond Town now with these restored buildings can be the staging area for these trades and for these processes. So if you were to come here in the 1970s, you would find people working with leather, 
you would find harness makers, you would find potters, you'd find tinsmiths, you'd find blacksmiths, you'd find dressmakers, you'd find an amazing array of dedicated professional people who were plying these trades. And similar to what Tim said, these folks were often engaging in what is known as experimental archaeology, which means that if I'm a living historian and I have these tools, there might not be a book on how to use them. So I have to start tinkering and figuring out how these things go together. And then you figure out that, you know, the thing you think is a plant is actually a bug, right? So similar to what Tim was saying before about dying. So historic Richmond town has been a, a home for this laboratory of restoration, of preservation and, and education, this continuum through time. Um, so the dedicated tradespeople of historic Richmond town are the backbone of it. And we have an incredible wealth of knowledge in the ranks of the educators who remain to this day. Uh, this is a photograph of two, of, two, uh, of two staff at Richmond Town who actually uh, met and had a romance that blossomed through uh, historic Richmond Town. Carlotta and Don DeFillo, shout out to you. Um, many domestic arts have been practiced at uh, historic Richmond Town over the decades. Um, things like laundry, as we're, see, as we're seeing here in this historic photograph, uh, weaving, dyeing, just like at Old Beth Page, cheese making, butter making, soap making. Um, and I thought about the question we had from the audience about what's relevant. I think today people are very interested in making their own things, especially in the midst of the pandemic. So I think these trades uh, that are sort of, you know, maybe not as popular uh, as they were years ago are coming back into fashion uh, on a personal level. Field trips are a, a big draw at historic Richmond Town. And this is, of course, an old photo from when it was known as Richmond Town Restoration. Um, and so, you know, you could take a bus all the way to Richmond Town and go back in time through Open Village where you can walk through the village and see buildings staffed by tradespeople. Um, when the village was full of, of life as far as educators, one can imagine the scenes that would transpire here. Um, uh, really uh, time travel in its purest form. Uh, we still have a dedicated core of tradespeople uh, who we, we are proud to have. I have a picture here of one of our blacksmith and our carpenter, uh, Cooper extraordinaire, Norm Peterson. And again, these people keep these traditions alive, and they also pass on what they know to the next generation. Uh, hearth cooking and brick and brick oven cooking are time-honored traditions at historic Richmond Town, honoring recipes from uh, people who lived in these structures, uh, people who settled here, immigrants, enslaved people. Uh, it's all part of it's all part of that narrative. Um, I had a little video here that I could play, which is just a uh, a uh, a, a B-roll, so to speak, of the typical scenes of uh, historic Richmond Town. It may or may not, uh, it may or may not come through very strongly on the on the stream. But this is inside the Guyan Lake Tyson House, showing us hearth cooking. I think you're seeing like every other frame. Uh, plenty of fiber arts demonstrated at historic Richmond Town. You're seeing carding of wool here, uh, which is critical to getting impurities out of pure wool. Uh, there's our there's our carpenter. Um, so what we're seeing here is, just like Old Beth Page, uh, Historic Richmond Town hosts the Richmond County Fair. It has for the last 40 years. And for our big special events, living history is, is always a part of the backdrop and is part of the draw. And it's part of what people expect to see when they come to Historic Richmond Town. Um, it's something that they did as kids, either as apprentices or as uh, visitors, and they want, they want their children to experience that as well. So you'll see it just takes a generation or two for a place like this to become ingrained in the, in the popular understanding of a place. Talking about sensory perception, music, the debate in a tavern, this is also part of that texture of everyday life. Um, music is a great way to experience the sounds of the past. And especially for our 21st century mind, it can be hard for us to understand that when people wanted to sing, they had to sing to each other and wanted to hear music. Um, the Apprentice Program has been also a time-honored tradition at Richmond Town, and this is uh, photographs from our uh, apprentices over the years. Many of our volunteers today, staff, uh, members, board members, were apprentices decades ago. Um, and so I believe Old Bethpage Village also has a strong apprentice tradition. So it's very, very interesting how these places echo each other uh, in what they do, what they provide, and what they mean to the community. It's very important. 
Uh, I've focused a lot on domestic arts and, and sciences, so to speak, but there's also a tradition of military living history. And so we have wonderful connections with living historians across the region and across the country. This is a photograph from a new program that launched last year called To Die Free, especially focused on the African-American experience of the American Civil War. So these gentlemen are dressed as USCT, US Colored Troops, um, so demonstrating the segregation in the, uh, in the Union Army, um, but also the opportunities that would be afforded to a black soldier in, in the 1860s. A narrative that is not often seen outside of perhaps Hollywood traditions and scholarship that we're seeing now with renewed interest in the American Civil War. So historic Richmond Town, like Old Bethpage Village, is a staging area, a backdrop for limitless possibilities of, of presentation. Uh, uh, Richmond Town is not dedicated to one epoch or one era. It's, it's many centuries, so it's not just one period of time. Um, you sort of walk through time as you go from building to building, and in some cases, from room to room. Sometimes those, uh, there's different period rooms in a building that jump from era to era. So one of the uh, challenges of Richmond Town is that sense of time travel because we have the cars going through the village all the time. Um, and sometimes, sometimes that disrupts the actual flow of a living history presentation, and sometimes it endangers the buildings themselves. And so even though restoration has been largely finished at Richmond Town, when an accident happens, like the one that uh, a car that slammed into our historic tavern, we have to raise funds, restore the building once again, and bring it back to life. Uh, so this is the guy in tavern that unfortunately suffered a terrible blow um, just a few years ago. But the building has been restored once again and now hosts tavern concerts just like it has for years. So there's always challenges with sites like ours with preservation and restoration. Um, I want to close my portion as I'm going on a little bit long here uh, with some ideas about the future. Uh, what's changed over time? Some trades have come, some trades have gone. Just like Old Bethpage Village Restoration, Historic Richmond Town faced a bleak budget in the 1990s. Um, uh, we received funding from the city, from the Department of Cultural Affairs, um, and due to those cuts, many trades and tradespeople were no longer sustained by the, by the organization. But we too are dedicated to building back our trades and bringing them back to the forefront. Uh, in those days, in the 60s and 70s, we would refer to these living historians as tradesmen. They are men. Only men can practice trades. Well, today we would call them tradespeople, acknowledging that men and women practiced trades. But also today, men and women present trades. So we have an incredible tinsmith by the name of Annie Wickerstee. Perhaps there were not many female tinsmiths in the 19th century, but she is a tinsmith and she is an expert in that material. And who are we to say that she can't present that because she's a woman? Um, if you go to Minuteman National Park, they have Minute Women. There certainly were not such things in the 1770s, but we cannot prevent people from educating and accessing this information. Um, so it's always good to present that with some context. So I spoke about this before, I think Tim mentioned it, the idea of first person versus third person. Um, often third person presentation is the best mode. First person presentation is, my name is George Washington and welcome to my home. Third person is, hi, my name is Luke and I'm dressed like George Washington, welcome to Mount Vernon. Right, so it's, I'm wearing the costume to help with the time travel, but we know that we're in 2020. And that's really the most effective mode of presentation for the lion's share of our programming. But first person does have its moments. Uh, it's very theatrical. Certainly Winston Churchill is a first person gig. Uh, and so there's a, there's a balance that comes with that. Um, often young people want to ask in first person, they want to they destroy the illusion. You know, we'll see a, a plane flying over and they'll say, well, what's that? Mr. Washington, you know, and you have to kind of pivot around that. So that's, that can be a challenge. Um, I want to acknowledge this slide that I have up here at the conclusion. Um, this is a photograph from Richmond Town in the 20th century, and it shows us uh, a building in the rear now known as the Edwards Barton House, um, the white building seen there, a Victorian uh, house. In the front is a modern 20th century restaurant called Aquilino's Pizzeria. 
So the Aquilino family owned the restaurant and they lived in the house behind it. And they were the tenants who were there the longest of all the families. They deeded the house to Richmond Town and it is now the Edwards, Edwards Barton House. It will soon be known as the Edwards Barton Aquilino House. In the 20th century, the elevation and preservation of Italian American narratives was not in the forefront. Decades later, you cannot separate the Italian American identity from Richmond Town. You have to acknowledge it. You have to interpret it. You have to talk about it. Um, so who's to say that we couldn't have programming acknowledging and celebrating recipes from early Italian American restaurants on Staten Island? Who's to say we couldn't have a event in which we finally determine what the best pizza of Staten Island is using the Aquilinos as that tangible link? I also was thinking about like living history about pandemics. What's that gonna look like decades from now, you know, to acknowledge the, 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 flu, of, uh, the flu of 1918, the pandemic of 2020? Will there be, you know, just like we have suffragists marching through town, will there be a, you know, lockdown pandemic kind of living history program that could come years from now? So there's limitless possibilities to this. I think the more we open our imagination to it. Um, so I just want to say thank you everyone for participating. Dom, if you had a question for me, we can, we can, you can ask or we can move to the audience. Oh yeah, you're, you're not getting away that easily. Yeah. So I have a, <laughs> I, I have a, a question from the uh, chat regarding uh, Moses. Uh, any irony in Moses' role as a preservationist given his public works agenda elsewhere? But is that what is needed for preservation, autocratic authority? It's a, it's a very heavy question, and uh, but I'll, I'll give you 30 seconds to answer it now. I think it's fascinating to think about how Richmond Town, how old Beth Page came to be. And I think the way budgets are drawn now, it would be impossible to conceive of these massive projects being done today, um, just with the way that these things operate. You needed someone like Moses in your corner if you wanted to get these kinds of things off the ground. Um, but I don't, think, I don't think that kind of muscular, you know, I don't think any one person has that much power now, thankfully, in our government. Um, but it's a great question. And it, it, it does beg a question about, you know, the future of these sites. You know, I don't think, there, I don't think there's, there's, you know, a necessity or room for, for expansion because these projects are so costly and so demanding. Um, but there is a need to sustain these places. So we need to have linkages, and we do, to our elected officials. You know, Old Beth Page Village Restoration is part of Nassau County. Um, uh, Historic Richmond Town has linkages to the Cultural Institutions Group of New York, um, the Department of Cultural Affairs. Those linkages prop this place up. They keep it going um, through those storms, and this is one of those storms. So it's an interesting question, but... Um, you know, so yeah, in, in lieu of not having a Rockefeller, it was good to have Robert Moses in your corner. You know, if you're not going to be a, a, a financial, you know, sort of baron, there's the, there's the political, political equivalent of it. Yeah, too, is, there, is, there, is, there, is there a Robert Moses connection to Beth Page? <laughs> not, not, uh, we're not that old. Um, but, uh, I mean, we, we uh, you know, to piggyback, like, with what you're saying about um, Robert Moses, we had Eugene Nickerson, who was the county executive at the time. And, and, and you know, luckily he had, a, he had a team in the early 1960s that was very willing to approve something like this. And, and um, yeah, exactly what you said. Unfortunately, I don't think you're going to see any new uh, living history villages popping up anywhere. It's just um, way too costly and very, very difficult. And... Um, I, looking through, here's that here's that Nassau County Journal I was looking at, but um, looking through that before, I was actually able to see that one of the buildings when they moved to here in the 60s from two miles away, the, the church that we have here, cost $2,000 in the 1960s from two miles away. So I can't imagine what it would take to move the house that we have from Manorville uh, over here in today's currency. That would be insane. Dom, do we have any other questions from the audience? I think you had a couple other questions in your bank. Yeah, I just, I definitely uh, wanted to just touch on the fact that um, 
I want to throw it back to Luke and, and ask him because you've definitely worked in this very wide range of different kind of historical institutions. You know, everything from like Mark Twain to the 9-11 Museum, which I know you've put a lot of work and years into. What are some things from other types of historical institutions that you secretly think might be beneficial to bring to a, a living history museum such as HRT? That's a great question. Um, Hmm. I mean, I, you know, in my role, in my role with public programs, I am interested in expanding the kind of offerings we have, um, where not everything has to be a costumed thing. Um, there's many other ways we can interpret and present. Um, I think it'd be interesting to engage with the military history of Staten Island. I think you know, we have a wonderful uh, domestic arts approach and this uh, these these living trades um, and all of that, uh, but there's certainly room for uh, for more of a military history. Um, you know, we can craft field trips around uh, the colonial experience of as we already have. We can expand those um, even more. Um, you know, looking at November is coming up with Veterans Day, so I'm thinking about what we can do uh, to to acknowledge Veterans Day. Um, you know, this site is at the edge of the Richmond Creek and Fresh Kills. The Fresh Kills landfill is one of our neighbors nearby, which is an incredible uh, resource for, for the city and for the state. And I'd be very interested in having a, a walk through time or a talk through time with them. Um, you know, and we could even have programming around September 11th commemoration. We've already done exhibits. Uh, about 9-11 years ago. A co wonderful collection of 9-11 related tattoos, photographs is in our collection. Um, and people might say, oh, pish posh, that's not Richmond Town. Our mandate is the island. It's the Staten Island Historical Society and it's centuries of life, not just 1760 to 1840. You know, that's limiting. And not just, you know, a presentation of white settlers. We can talk a lot more about the enslaved on Staten Island. We can talk a lot more about other immigrant populations on Staten, like the Italians and so forth. It need not be a impersonation of a pizza maker. That would probably be inappropriate, but we can certainly use living history techniques to create new programs. So I think it, and I think that's, that's what you have to do with this approach because living history popularly is not where it was. So you have to look at new ways of, of doing things um, in the future. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to open it up to both of you. I mean, uh, Luke touched on this a bit about the kind of history that I know our founder was more interested in, the sort of every day. And um, I was wondering what the two of you think the uh, the effects of this sort of anti-Carlisle type of history is um, resounding out through the surrounding societies. Like if they're, the history of a, of a culture or society is focused more on the everyday, the, the tinkerer, the workman, the, you know, uh, the wife and mother, what does that, how does that represent back out into the society? Is it, in a, is it a positive in the way we move forward or is, does it get caught up in the details of the everyday? And uh, how do you guys think that relates to the wider culture around us? <laughs> wow, I wish I got that question in writing before. Um, that's a that's a huge. That's, that's a good a huge, one. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, at the end of the day, you uh, museums present and they they interpret. The public will take what they wish to take. We can have goals and objectives. Um, but at the end of the day, people will still walk away from the museum and they say, see, I told you, honey, people were shorter back then, right? So you can't, you can't uh, aggressively tell people what to think or what to take away. Um, but I think, you know, it's just an engagement with these terms. What does every day mean? What does common people mean? What did it mean to Loring McMillan in the 1940s? What does it mean to you or I in 2020? Um, it's, a, it's a big question and it's tempting just to preserve things as they are and keep going. But as we know with the events of the last few months, even sleepy little living history museums should and can increase their inclusion 
and diversify their narratives, represent different kinds of people that they haven't in the past. It's a big effort. It does not happen overnight. It's talk about day four, day five, day six. It's a long term process. Um, but yes, I think at the end of the day, this is history as play and people will play with us and they will take away what they wish and they want to have a good time. It's, it's edutainment after all. So there may be space in public programming and podcasts, more digital assets where we can have a more nuanced approach to the history. But by and large, we have to confront the audience that we have, which is hyper-local, which um, you know, may trade in some popular nostalgia, which is just how we consume history as people. Um, so we have to meet people where they're at and then maybe take them by the hand or not by the hand during COVID, but, you know, figuratively, you know, lead them, lead them to where we want to go. I'll pass it over to Tim. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's about in, including the, uh, the modernization takes on things as well as uh, adapting to what that is. It's not about... Um, changing or destroying the history that you already have. It's, it's about uh, interpreting it and bringing it into the new lights that are, that are uh, what modern audiences and, and, and modern social cues are, are giving the museum. And, um, you know, uh, things have to adapt. Like I said, I'm, I'm not gonna say change because it's not changing, you're, you're adapting to it. So you don't wanna forget any of it. It's about the, the way that it's handled, the, um, the, the ability to, uh, to do it correctly and to um, uh, make it accessible for everybody and just to, uh, to, to make it great. So yeah, to, to, to bring it full circle. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it, it is okay. This is a day in life. Um, whose life, uh, what time period, um, you know, uh, obviously you guys have the, the, the spectrum of several centuries, which is awesome. Um, for us, we don't necessarily have that, but that's why we're bringing in the different, the different time periods uh, and sort of incorporating it in. And, um, you know, you wanna, you wanna do it, uh, you want to showcase in different, uh, different lights and different efforts to try to uh, make a fuller understanding for everybody that's visiting. That's well said. Tom, I have the results of the poll. I'm yes, gonna... are we getting to that? Ooh, awesome, okay. Yeah, so I just shared the results. Can you see them? Yeah. So uh, number one was, have you visited Old Bethpage Village Restoration before? And we got about 41% saying yes. Uh, I unfortunately was not one of them, but I'm going to be very soon. Uh, Long Island cannot keep me away any longer. <laughs> And, um, and then number two, have you visited historic Richmond town in the past? And we got about 59%. So we're leading slightly more Staten Island, a little less Long Island right now in the, in the chat, but very close. And I love that, that it's, the, they're both very close. And number three, have you visited these other living history museums? Now, uh, a lot of people, 82% have said that they've visited Colonial Williamsburg before. Uh, Old Sturbridge Village actually comes in second, which is super cool, at 53%. And then the Plymouth Plantation at 29%. Uh, the Genesee Country, Country Village and Museum at 12%. The Museum Village in Monroe, New York. Oh, I went there as a child. Uh, at 12%. And then Strawberry Bank and Fort Ticonderoga, I hope I'm not butchering that name, come in at 24 percent wow so a colonial williamsburg is definitely the champ what do you guys think of this poll was this basically what you were assuming it yeah jives with what i thought it was hard to determine which ones to include there's a lot of other living history museums that aren't on this list um sort of a, a smattering of some that are in the northeast and new york but yeah colonial williamsburg and sturbridge are probably if you had to do a, a family feud, it would be like the top, the top two, you know, we asked 100 people, what's the Living History Museum? They would say, they would say that. Right. Yeah. And probably, probably so to go as far as to say, probably uh, not just the East Coast, probably for the country, actually. Um, you know, I, I would say that. 
Right. I, I'm a little. I haven't been to. Uh, surprisingly, I actually haven't been to Sturbridge Village um, because I'm always I'm always here. Um, but uh, I would love to go. I have one of one of my uh, work colleagues is is the, is the president over there. Um, but uh, I haven't been able to go. Um, so I need to make a point for that one. Yeah. I had a question that I wanted to to address or just to contemplate something we were talking about when we were putting this together. We wanted to acknowledge you know, um, the protests after the murder of George Floyd and the way that Confederate monuments have been re-examined in a way like never before. Um, certainly not, you know, it wasn't looked like that during the sesquicentennial Civil War. Um, but now in this cultural moment, those conversations are being had. And I'm curious, because I haven't been to a Living History event in the pandemic, um, but I'm curious about in the community, if, if there's any chatter about Confederate reenactors. And if, you know, there's a shift maybe happening with regard to how that's presented in sites like this. Um, you know, in the North, we tend to focus on the Union, but you, often in these, especially military events, you have to have two sides, like, like Tim said, to tell the story, but also to drive whatever narrative or action you want to have. Um, when I first went to the Museum of American Armor and I, I heard there were Germans, I was very curious. I said, you know, and I was told by the mutual contact we have that, that the people who, who dress up like Germans are vetted, vetted, and vetted again, because you don't want someone who's going to espouse the views of the person who is re uh, what they're reenacting, right? So that's, again, where a third person comes into play. Um, so I was wondering, Tim, if you had heard anything about that in the, in the network or if you thought at all about what that looks like going forward. Yeah, um, so... It's, and in regard to um, how the Museum of American Armor does the, the Germans versus Americans thing is, um, it's all about how it's portrayed. And I will say they, they absolutely do that um, correctly. And a lot of the Civil War units are doing the same thing. Um, where it's about, um, you want to show them as, I am uh, for the Union Army and this was my enemy. Um, so they can still talk about all the gear that they have and everything. They can talk about what they were, uh, you know, what they were fighting for, which honestly, for a lot of the individual soldiers um, fighting in the Confederate States, it, it wasn't about the bigger picture. They, you know, uh, General Lee even, um, you know, he went, he was a West Point grad, one of the highest in his class. And, uh, and he, um, he was fighting for Virginia <laughs> and for Virginia's rights whether or not those rights were for specific things. Um, but he wasn't fighting for the entirety of the South. He, he cared about his home state. Um, so each one of their individual stories, I think, is something that would need to get presented. Um, a lot of the talk in the uh, reenactor community for that um, dives around that, as well as there is a lot of talk that um, in the future, they're not going to be looking to be waving any sort of battle flags or anything like that. Um, they might bring one, put it on the table, um, or you might bring one and put it on the table with the Union soldiers and saying this is almost like a, like a spoil. Um, and uh, trying to show it that way, that, that this is my enemy, there's respect on both sides, um, but not trying to, uh, what's the term? Uh, bolster it up too much um, right. as to what it is. You're not going to diminish why they were fighting and by any means. You're not going to diminish that. You want to show what the reasons were or, or tell what the reasons were. Um, it, it's more a way to say where have we gotten from here or from there rather than um, that it's still, uh, it, you know, it is like something to be promoted. Sure. Once, once, yeah. And I acknowledge that the question is, is kind of bonkers because we're still in a stasis of arrested programming and we haven't seen reenactments happen post COVID and post, you know, George Floyd and the Confederate wedge issues and all of this. So I'm just curious, it'll be interesting in the next few years as that kind of stuff continues, what it looks like. And I think, I think it comes down to there's different, not all reenactors, living historians are created equal. Some people are purists with regard to what they present, you know, for fear of farbing you know, wearing the wrong shoe, you know, wearing the wrong thing. Um, and that's their focus, is the accuracy of the look. Some people are, just really want to play, and they just want to time travel themselves and, and feel like their ancestors did. Um, but, you know, you can't prevent 
those tropes from being trafficked. If I'm dressed like a Confederate soldier, it's probably very easy for me to take refuge in the state's rights justification. When we know with modern scholarship, the Civil War is about slavery, and that's it. You know, so there's no room for, for anything else. Um, but there's a difference between a volunteer reenactor teacher and someone who's like a staff member. That being said, many of the reenactors I have met and worked with are some of the most skilled and dedicated communicators I've ever known and can, and can, 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 um, can thread that needle like no one else because they're so practiced in it and they're so passionate about it. They've done all the research. They've done all the reading. Um, I think there were another couple of questions in the chat. One was, does either museum address transportation modes through time periods? I think, I think OBVR does that. Yeah, so we have, um, we have a pretty large um, collection of uh, wagons and rickshaws and carts and things like that. And, um, though we don't always use them when we're doing uh, parades or during the Long Island Fair or something like that, um, we will have those out and available usually with write-ups or sometimes they'll even be in use during the parades. Um, actually right now, since we, we still haven't totally opened uh, or we haven't opened at all, but uh, I'm inside the general store down in the village right now and right in front of me is a uh, penny farthing bicycle. So technically transportation, that's one of the things that when the kids are here, um, usually I'll hop on that and, and ride it around. But um, yeah, we try, to, we try to showcase it. There was actually some talk back in the, um, back in the 80s that they wanted to put in a, uh, a couple of the people here wanted to put a train going around the outside of the village, which would look super cool. Um, that would probably be insane on upkeep and maintenance, but, uh, but that would have been pretty cool. Yeah, they wanted it's very, to. Do it's very Disney, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. It's our historic um, kingdom instead of Magic Kingdom. I know Richmond Town has many, like, uh, vehicles, you know, uh, carriages, uh, means of conveyance, like horse-drawn items and things like that, that are in our collection. Uh, but you know that's those those you know the challenge of, of bringing something like that out is that you endanger it so much if you were to demonstrate it or roll it out, and so there's that curatorial catch twenty two of you know preservation and access, and that's a unique challenge. I think that dovetails into our next question, right, Don? Yes, it does. I was uh, here's another question from the chat. Uh, so someone from the chat would like you both to uh, tell us more about living collections and the positives and struggles with that. Sure. So uh, thank you, Jessica, for the question. Um, I, think with, I think the challenge of a place like Historic Richmond Town is that, you know, we had potters and uh, trades people who would create things in abundance. So we have redware in our collection and tin implements in our collection. Um, that were made 20, 30 years ago, and we still use them for our demonstrations today. And we also have these buildings and these artifacts that some of them are extremely aged and, and, uh, and you know, just uh, challenged physically. So it's a difficulty of use. We have an amazing printer in our print shop, um, but it's used very strategically a few times a year, like Old Home Day and some of our very traditional uh, sort of living history uh, ex exhibition days. The challenge is if you, the more you use it, the more it can rust, the more it, you know, might need repair or service, um, but you want people to see it. You want people to, to, to commune with it. So maybe it's a printing demonstration that we do online in which a hundred people can see it. Maybe they can't smell the ink, um, but they can see it. And so maybe this digital frontier is where, is where we're headed. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a definite challenge. Um, of using what we have, uh, trying to create access, but also trying to preserve the, the assets. Right. Yeah. It's the it's the same the same thing here. You know. Um, luckily, both of our both of our institutions have where the majority of the upkeep and the work needs to be done to the buildings because they're always out there. Um, at least I'm assuming I'm assuming that would be the same for you guys. Um, but, uh, you know, we, yeah, we, we try not to use the artifacts as much as possible if we can get reproductions or if we have reproductions from the, from the, from the years that we've been open. We try to use that as, as much as we can because, um, 
you can always make more reproductions. Yeah, it costs money, but you can always you can always make them. You can make duplicates of originals, but the originals, once they're gone, they're gone. Um, so you know, you try not to use them much, if much at all, um, or or as little as possible. Um, it's just a matter of trying to see what you're trying to showcase. And I, and I like what you said a lot of, you know, doing, doing the printing there. Um, it would be kind of weird to not necessarily hear in person that stick that happens, uh, you know, like that I've heard so many times at Williamsburg or in, um, uh, what is it, the Benjamin Franklin's printing office in Philly, um, where it's just, it's awesome when you hear that and you see it and every, there's blue going everywhere and it's great. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's actually a really, that's a really good idea to sort of preserve it. It's tough inside the buildings in general, um, especially in the summertime with humidity and other things that go into it. You know, um, some places are climate controlled, other, a, a majority of them are not. Um, and so it's just kind of difficult to upkeep everything, but, um, you know, you try as best as you can and, uh, and, and you want that, you want the things to last for, for future generations to enjoy too. Well, um, I could honestly sit here and talk with the two of you all day. This has been a, uh, amazing, uh, opportunity for me before we, we head to our conclusion. Can I just ask one quick question? because uh, we have Decker Farm, but we have, uh, we're sans animals at this current moment. Could you just talk a little bit about um, the piglets you guys have or maybe some of the other animals that are there just for my own, my yeah. own personal gratification? I was actually, I was actually going to try to grab one and, uh, and, and, and have it over here for the chat so uh, he could talk to you. But um, yeah, so we have, we have two piglets right now. Um, we've got uh, six goats. We've got a bunch of sheep. The sheep actually, um, they breed every year. Uh, so we always have a ton of sheep here, um, and we get to use their wool for things. We have three cows, which people often confuse for bulls because they do have horns. Um, fun fact, dairy cows do have horns, just most modern dairy industries do remove the horns to make it safer for their workers. Um, and, uh, what else? We've got geese, ducks, um, chickens, turkeys. Um, the turkeys are pretty cool. Uh, if you have anything shiny on you, turkeys will actually go and, and, and peck at it a little bit, but it's, it's just a turkey. They're not going to bother you too much. Um, so it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, we have lots of different animals, um, which is great. It's not a petting zoo, uh, but it is uh, really cool that people can come here and, and, and get to see it and get to see the farmers interacting with them. Awesome. So, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for joining us for this virtual program. We appreciate your attendance, but not only that, but your support. And despite the museum's closure here at Historic Richmond Town due to the pandemic, we are committed to creating opportunities for learning, engagement, and of course, enrichment through this uncertain time. I personally encourage you to visit our website and social media channels for our arts and culture and quarantine series of videos, including living history demos, tours of historic buildings, and many, and a lot of other really cool stuff. There's uh, songs that are sung, there are book reviews, there's tons of cool stuff on there to check out. Uh, we are also engaged in a collecting initiative, collecting the, collecting the pandemic to preserve physical objects, photographs, and personal accounts relating to the experiences of Staten Islanders during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you would like any to donate anything to this effort, please see our website. And uh, Tim, would you like to tell us what's going on at Old Bethpage coming up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, pretty interesting is, is just this week, actually, um, and just this morning, uh, Nassau County Executive Laura Kern uh, came out saying that we are, in fact, going to be opening on July 31st, so in just a couple weeks. So um, all the staff got called back, which is awesome. Um, we are super excited to finally be opening again because... Uh, I think this is the um, most uh, in, uh, educational conversation I've had. Usually I'm just here by myself with the dolls and the artifacts, so I can't really talk to them too much. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's great. Um, so, yeah, we'll be opening on Fridays through Sundays, only three days to start, just to see how it goes and what goes on with the pandemic moving forward. Um, but we're going to be doing uh, timed ticket entries and uh, doing ticket sales online. 
Um, so that way nobody has to exchange any, any money down here, but we're going to have buildings open, trades being demonstrated, the animals will be out there. Uh, so it should be really, really cool. And I think the Museum of American Armor, I believe will be open Wednesdays through Sundays. Um, uh, if he, if, if, if he's still in the chat, he could maybe, uh, uh, say exactly, but I think it's Wednesdays through Sundays, 10 to two, um, starting on the 29th of this month. So, uh, both facilities on, on our property will be open and available to the public as of the 31st, which is great. Awesome. Thank you, you guys both so much. It was a real pleasure. I'm in, you know, history nerd heaven right now, but, um, I just want to thank Tim and Luke for coming here and speaking with us today. I want to thank everyone in the chat who was giving amazing, knocking out of the park those questions. I'm super excited. And I'm really excited to do more of these historic Richmond Town Talks. This is really only the beginning of this series. So um, I just want to thank everyone and wish everyone to be safe. And if you guys want to sign off, each of you, I would appreciate that. Yeah, so thank you guys so much for, for having, I'll let you finish it out, Luke, because you, you, it was your idea, so we're going to do it. Um, but uh, you get the last word, man, but I hope you do it as, as um, Winston. Um, so uh, we're, <laughs> see, and I say it now, I didn't say it yesterday, I say it now, so he has yeah. to do it because all of you are watching. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for having me, Dom and Luke, it's been great talking to you guys. Um, like I said, it's been, it's been, it has been slow here with the pandemic. So it, it is absolutely wonderful, um, to be able to confer with like minds and then to be able to bring it to, uh, everybody watching is, is, is great. And thank you again. Tim, thank you so much. Uh, you are a consummate professional. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. I know you wear many, many hats over there in old Beth page. Um, thank you, Dom, for being such an excellent moderator. Thank you to the audience for tuning in. Uh, remember to never, never, never give up. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's it. That's all you're going to get out of me from that. What I, I will it. say is that this will be available for digital download on the HRT website. Um, there's a page on our website for historic Richmond Town Talks. A digital download will be available there um, to you. So thank you all so much for being a part of this, and thanks for uh, participating. Everybody stay safe out there. Yeah, bye guys, stay safe. Thanks.